It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. As we approach the final phase of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, there will be countless discussions of the enduring importance of that conflict in American history and its ongoing legacy in race, politics, and economics of American society. We have long been taught a mythic story of an iconic moment at the end when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union Commander Ulysses S. Grant in April 1865. Of Lee's refined elegance in defeat, Grant showing generosity and forgiveness to the Southern Army, how the wisdom and grace of those two men prevented a final bloodbath and set the country on a path to harmony and reunion. But is that story true? In an important new book, historian Elizabeth Varon argues that the scene at Appomattox Courthouse was not a moment of national healing, but instead set the stage for a great ideological struggle over the meaning of the South's surrender, one that would cynically twist the future of America and delay by decades the full liberation of four million enslaved African Americans and their descendants. Thanks for being here, Liz. My pleasure the standard narrative of the surrender at Appomattox, of Lee in his dress uniform, perfect and immaculate, uh, arriving with honor and grace to submit his surrender, Grant mud spattered, um, uh, fresh from the battlefield, as it were, uh, being magnanimous, uh, and, that, and that this moment of ultimate patriotism, in a sense, as it's always been described, uh, that this moment perhaps was not what it has been taught, was not how it has been taught to us, and perhaps was actually a kind of propaganda. Tell us about why it is that the story we know of Appomattox may not, in fact, be what happened. So let's linger on that surrender scene for, for just a moment. It's a familiar tableau for most Americans. As you said, Lee and Grant meet uh, in the McLean House in the modest uh, central Virginia hamlet of Appomattox Courthouse. Lee is dressed in his a fine dress uniform. He embodies the gentility of the South's planter elite. Grant, in his mud splattered uniform, embodies the hard scrabble wage earners and farmers he had molded into a formidable army. The two men exchange pleasantries about their service in the Mexican War. Then they get down to business. They agree to the terms that effectively end the Civil War. Grant releases Lee's men, the conquered soldiers of the Army of the Northern Virginia, sets them free on the understanding that they will never again take up arms against the United States. Lee is gracious in defeat. He chooses the path of peace rather than the option of guerrilla warfare. The two men inaugurate a healing of the country and set the stage for its ascendance as a world power. This is the myth of Appomattox as a gentleman's agreement. And it is a, an edifying story and a comforting story. There's a lot to like about it. It suggests that this is a moment of sublime selflessness on the part of these two iconic figures. The problem with this myth of the surrender as a gentleman's agreement is that it distorts what actually happened at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, and, and it distorts the meaning of the surrender for those uh, who lived uh, in, this, in this moment. The historical record shows, and I'll argue today, that Lee and Grant bring to the table at Appomattox two utterly incompatible visions of the meaning of the war and of the purpose of the peace. So for Grant, the war is a victory of, uh, the Union victory was a victory of right over wrong. And his magnanimity was the means to an end. It was a means to an end of Confederate capitulation first, but then a Confederate repentance and atonement. He believed that the Confederates uh, had sinned, uh, that secession was a crime and a sin, and that his magnanimity was uh, an inducement for them to uh, have a change of heart uh, uh, in effect. Grant's magnanimity, uh, in his own eyes, is an emblem of the moral superiority of free society, of, of the Union. And he believes that in, uh, in this moment of victory, he is making no concession whatsoever to Lee. Grant believes that he has all the cards, and that his is the mercy of a victor whose victory was total. Lee has a very different view of things. In Lee's mind, the Union victory is not a victory of right over wrong, but a victory of might over right. 
Lee believes at Appomattox that he has secured honorable terms in a negotiation, secured honorable terms for his blameless men. There's nothing to repent of or atone for in his, uh, in his mind. Uh, in, in Lee's eyes, Grant's magnanimity is a concession to the courage of Southern soldiers. Grant's eyes at this moment are fixed very firmly on the future. He imagines now that his magnanimity opens the way for this change of heart, that the Confederate masses can be disenthralled from their subservience to the elite slaveholders uh, who, who they had followed into, uh, into war. Lee, uh, by contrast, as he speaks of the peace, he uses again and again, we see this word crop up in his post-war correspondence, the word restoration. For Lee, a just peace will turn back the clock to the days of the early republic, uh, to the time when the virtue of the founders still prevailed, to a time when, before the Union's fall for grace, when Americans took it for granted that Virginians would lead the nation. Lee's is a fundamentally backward-looking view of the peace. And my emphasis is on the ways in which these two visions are incompatible, as I said and on their influence in post-war politics. These are, after all, apart from Lincoln, the two most prestigious men in the country. And if we want to understand the meaning of the surrender for those who experienced it, we have to understand that Americans believed that Lee and Grant would champion their respective causes in peace as they had uh, in war. So these two competing visions exert a great influence over, over post-war politics. And Appomattox, the surrender scene, and the terms, which on the face of it seem so simple, that really the essence of the gentleman's agreement is the notion that, that the surrender is transparent in meaning. Uh, but I argue that the transparent is, is a, uh, the surrender is a moment that is tense and ambiguous and fraught and controversial, uh, and that it serves as a touchstone. Even the very terms, simple though they may seem, serve as a touchstone for the political debates over Reconstruction. And what was Grant counting on in the mind of yeah. Lee that ultimately turned out not to be the well, case? Well, Grant was, was uh, counting on the, f uh, the fact that Southerners would be grateful for this show of magnanimity. He uh, expected them to be surprised. Grant, in the eyes of Confederates, had been the very image of mercilessness. Uh, and he was, the, the way his army had hammered Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in the last year of the war. He was the butcher. He was the butcher, right, as, as his... Uh, northern critics uh, called him uh, as well. So he uh, hoped and expected that Southerners would be grateful for this show of magnanimity uh, and that, um, again, really the primary assumption on, on Grant's part is an assumption that ran very deep in the ideology of the Republican Party, Lincoln's Republican Party, uh, and that they clung to as a, almost a, a fantasy, even in the face of a great deal of evidence that it was not, in fact, a good description of reality. And this was the fantasy that, um, that again, that the Southern masses had uh, been made to follow the, the plantation elite, and that there was latent uh, resentment against this, and that if they could be disenthralled, uh, if the way could be open for the flow of progressive ideas, they would see and concede that the free labor system was, was superior. And Grant was hoping, again, to affect such a uh, such a, a, uh, a conversion uh, in, 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 the minds of, uh, in the minds of Confederates. So he's fundamentally misunderstanding and misinterpreting what is actually a far more prevalent uh, mindset of, right. of, Southerners, of white right. Southerners in general. Right. So the, and, and let's turn to that, that mindset. Grant believed that his army's victory flowed from the superior virtue of its cause and from the superior bravery of his troops. But the Confederates moved very quickly Lee, in his famous farewell address uh, in particular, moved very quickly to denigrate the Union victory, as I said, as a, as a show of, of might uh, over right. And this Lee's farewell address says very famously that the Confederates have been forced to yield to the overwhelming numbers uh, and resources of the Union Army. And, and on the face of this, this is, this is true. The Union did have more men and more resources. But that reference to numbers and resources carried all kinds of ideological freight. At that moment, Lee understood that if he could deny the legitimacy of the North's military victory, he could deny the North to impose its political, the North the right to impose its political will on the South. And that, in some sense, is the purpose of a Confederate emphasis on 
might overwrite. So the Confederates do not concede the courage of the Union troops. They do not concede their skill. They don't concede the virtue of, uh, of the Union cause. Instead, they argue that this has been, the war had devolved into a brutal contest uh, and that the Union had, in fact, not fought fair. Uh, it's, uh, to Lee's men, Lee's men in the last week of the war, his army is disintegrating. They're starving. They're desperate. The idea that they've been overwhelmed by the numbers and resources of the North absolutely resonates and rings true. But, but the numbers and resources of the North argument in the context of Confederate ideology, in the context of the defense of slavery and of the Confederate creed, conjures up other sorts of images. It conjures up images of a Northern army of, of hirelings and mercenaries. It conjures up images of rapacious Northern capitalists churning out the material of war in their, in their sort of smoking factories and so on. It conjures up images of a, of a, of a Northern society that, uh, that is, is ruthless. And I don't think Grant appreciates at that moment in which he extends the hand of mercy how quickly Southerners will move to denigrate the Union victory as, as, as something that is, because of the way the Union waged the war, something that is fundamentally illegitimate. Well, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit and talk through what exactly had been happening. Because sometimes, uh, I know I, uh, I lose track of, of exactly how quickly the sequence of events occurred. But, but first, what was that last week or two weeks before the surrender on, on that's agreed to on April the 9th? And then it's just uh, really a few days later that yeah. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. But, but how was it that, that Lee and his army had ended up in the, in the state that they were in on April the 9th? This last week of fighting is, is uh, fascinating and very, very important. And we have tended, I think, as Civil War scholars to discount the importance of that final campaign. Something I was reminded of this year, this is the sesquicentennial year of, the, uh, of 1863. 1863, a year of turning points, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, the Emancipation Proclamation. I was reminded as I read the letters and diaries of Lee's men uh, and read about the disintegration of this army, um, how fiercely they clung to the cause. Uh, they regarded Lee's surrender. When the white flags go up and men in his own army learn that he's surrendered, they, they react with disbelief. They believe him to have been capable of one more miracle, even at the, at the very bitter end when all the signs pointed to their imminent defeat. It's a reminder that in the eyes of both Confederates and of the Union Army, this last week of fighting is not a postscript to the great decisive battles of the war that happened in 1863 or 1864. The men in the Union Army and, the, and in the Confederate Army believe that in this last week, the fate of the war still hangs in the balance, that it still can be won and lost. So Lee's men have fled the trenches of Richmond and Petersburg at the beginning of April. They move west uh, into central Virginia. They're hoping eventually to veer south to hook up with Joseph Johnson's army in North Carolina. Grant's men, led by Sherman, are trying to block Lee's escape route. What begins as a chase becomes a running battle by about April 5th. Uh, and the Confederates are punished uh, in that uh, running battle, particularly at a debacle uh, known as Sailor's Creek, in which there are massive Confederate casualties and prisoners of war taken. Again, the Confederate army is starving, bereft of resources. Men are deserting, straggling. Um, and, uh, and, and the Union men are able to, to catch Lee and block his final escape route. He determines on the night of April 8th that he will try one last time on the morning of the 9th to punch a hole in the Union defenses and that if he's unable to, uh, he'll have to contemplate uh, surrender. He's unable to punch that hole in the Union defenses. And again, if we look at the accounts of Union men, Union rank and file, they emphasize how much was at stake in that week and how their own skill and bravery had won the day. One Union soldier, for example, said if, if we had even been even a couple hours behind Lee, he might have succeeded. Uh, so it was a heroic thing to have chased him down uh, in, in this way. And another thing that comes out in the accounts of Union soldiers, which is a little surprising and counterintuitive, is that many of these Union men thought of themselves and of Grant as the underdogs in this fight. We sometimes fail to appreciate that because this overwhelming numbers and resources notion is, still exerts a lot of influence. But Lee, after all, had bested one after another of the commanders of the uh, Army of the Potomac and of uh, uh, Union generals in the Eastern Theater. Lee was, was a, a sort of a god in the eyes of the Southern people, um, a, a, a military genius by, by all accounts, uh, and, and, and uh, the sort of the, the for Union men, the fact that the humble, unpretentious U.S. Grant had, in the end, proved 
uh, superior to the formidable Lee was, was another sort of source of, of pride they took away from this, what they believed, again, critical final campaign. Still a lot at stake in those, in those last days. Could you point out some fascinating things about uh, that, that final sequence of the war uh, in terms of the mythology of what happened and then the reality that now seems to be established? And so uh, there was the one part of the myth is how the Union Army shared its rations with the Confederates afterwards uh, in an act, a magnanimous act. And that's true, right? Yes, that's a, they did. That's an important part of the, the kindness and the effort toward reunion. But then there's this story of how Ulysses Grant, after the surrender, or as part of it, returns Lee's sword to him, Robert E. Lee's uh, uh, bejeweled sword, this very special sword. Um, Lee talks about, immediately after the surrender, that he had uh, only a few thousand men left uh, and that Grant had five times as many men. Lee talks about repeatedly that he had fewer than 10,000 men, 8,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, uh, and that he had begun this retreat with 35,000. Uh, the reality was that, uh, that all of those numbers, uh, you say, and other scholars I think agree, that that's not true. Yeah, there was a numbers game, and the numbers game mattered because of its symbolism. So Lee moves quickly to establish that the odds he had faced in the end had been insurmountable. And he writes Jefferson Davis and says he was outnumbered five to one uh, in the end. And uh, that he had sort of 8,000 effectives, men who were in shape to fight there on that last morning of April 9th, that attempt to punch a hole in the Union defenses. Scholars, historians at the uh, National Battlefield Park and others have have sort of gathered together all the existing returns and found that in the end, Lee faced odds of two to one. There were roughly 60,000 Union men and 30,000 Confederates in the vicinity of Appomattox. Not in five that last to one. Day. Not five to one. But uh, Confederates, not only Lee, once the, once the news of the surrender sort of travels over the wires and reaches southern communities, cities, and farms, and so on, Confederates show this same propensity to inflate the size of the Federal Army. So uh, what Lee had said were odds of 5 to 1 in accounts, Confederate diaries and letters become odds of 10 to 1 and 50 to 1 and 100 to, to 1 and so on, a uh, propensity to, to inflate the size of the Confederate Army. Again, on some level, uh, and understandably so, because the Union Army seemed sort of all-encompassing and endless in the eyes of, uh, in the eyes of, of, of Confederates. Um, there was an awkward uh, sort of element to all of this in the sense that there is a surrender ceremony, a stacking of the arms that takes place on April 12th. And lo and behold, more than 23,000 Confederates stack arms and receive paroles, the, the certificates vouching that they had been part of this final agreement, more than the 8,000 effectives that Lee claimed that, that he had. And Lee tries, and his men who rally around him, Lee's inner circle, his, his lieutenants, his, his right-hand men really rally around this overwhelming numbers and resources argument. Again, the point of it being there can be no shame in such a defeat um, to have lost uh, to such odds. Um, and they, they uh, will, will uh, in their post-war writings, uh, you know, engage in this, this inflation of numbers. And they'll explain the discrepancy between the number of men who, who were effectives and the number of men uh, who, who, um, who, offered a, who, who were in, in the surrender ceremony and who were paroled by saying that there had been men sort of detailed uh, uh, to, to, to the back of the army. There had been some stragglers and some deserters, that those 8,000 represent the kind of beating heart of the Confederate Army, the core, the core of the cause, the core heroes uh, uh, of the cause, and that, and that those, Lee will, in essence, make the argument that those men who had been present for duty in the final hour represented the very virtues which needed to be restored to national life, that his army and not Grant's represented the constancy and devotion and steadfastness that Lee associated with the halcyon days of the early republic and that needed to be restored to national life if the peace was going to take and be a, and be a just peace. But so these 20,000 missing Confederates, from missing from R.E. Lee's calculations at least, uh, I mean, what's your, uh, uh, what's your conclusion as to where they were. And were there actually 10,000 deserters at the end? Well, there weren't 10,000 deserters, but there were men straggling, clinging to the wagon trains that stretched to the north, uh, um, Longstreet's, uh, and, and to, to Longstreet's army. There were men who had, uh, who had drifted away. There was, the, the Confederates had, ex had experienced uh, 
significant casualties in that last week of fighting. So the real story is the story of the disintegration of the army between its uh, its sort of flight from R Richmond and Petersburg uh, up until the Appomattox moment. Now, for Lee, that story of disintegration was painful. In an April 20th letter to Jefferson Davis, he concedes that the army had disintegrated and that the men in the end didn't fight with the spirit and elan that they had when they had been successful. And he attributes this to uh, troubles on the home front, to people suffering back home, calling for their men to return. In other words, he acknowledges the toll of home front demoralization and of desertion on his army. But after he writes that letter to Jefferson Davis, he never again admits to himself in quite that way that disintegration and demoralization had been a factor. Because to admit it would be to open himself up and, and his countrymen, Confederates, up to recrimination and, and and uh, self-doubt and despair. And so he, he pushes that story of disintegration and demoralization to the side and enshrines instead the story of overwhelming odds, of unflinching constancy and devotion, the story of the farewell address. One narrative is meant to displace the other and push it aside because the narrative of demoralization and disintegration is simply too, um, too uh, uh, tragic in his eyes. And that mythology, that, that version of events, Lee's version of events, he begins to articulate that very quickly after the surrender. And you tell the fascinating stories I'd never heard of. Of uh, he, he goes back to the family home in Richmond after the surrender. He gets there a few days later. And Matthew Brady, the Civil War photographer, shows up and convinces him to, to allow a series of images to be taken, which become some of the most iconic Lee uh, images. And then a few days after that, uh, a newspaper reporter comes and, um, and he engages in an interview uh, about his, his assessment of what had happened. But how did those, tell us, tell us those, uh, about those two incidents and how the, this version of the surrender began to be put in place. Well, look, the context here is that Lee enjoys a reputation in the modern day as someone who counseled acceptance and submission and resignation to the situation. And, and that has always struck me as, as uh, it's, a, it's a sort of theory that doesn't add up in the sense that we know Lee was the most prestigious man in the South. We are told that he counseled submission, but we know in the end that the South didn't simply submit to the political will of the North, that Southerners, ex-Confederates, began very quickly to contest uh, the Northern uh, understanding of the meaning of the war and of the peace and, and Northern plans for reconstruction to contest them through political means and through extra legal means uh, and, and violent means. And what I found is that um, in the eyes of Confederates, Lee was not a symbol of submission. He was a symbol of a kind of unbowed uh, pride and a kind of measured defiance. So Grant leaves us a very long memoir in which he tells us what he was thinking at the moment of the surrender. Lee never leaves such a memoir. Lee will live for only five years after the surrender. But we do have these sources. We have Lee's exchange of letters with Grant, in which again and again he uses this word, sort of restoration to conjure his notion of a just peace. We have Lee's farewell address. We know he requested of Grant that each Confederate uh, soldier be given a printed parole pass as a kind of form of immunity from reprisal. We have Lee's interview about which I'll I'll, uh, to which I'll turn in just a moment. We have Lee's testimony before uh, a congressional committee looking into conditions in the South in February of 1866. We have Lee, letters Lee wrote in the post-war period. And if we put these things together, they paint a picture of Lee as a man who, yes, technically observed the terms of his parole, absolutely, but who in subtle ways was pointing the way towards the restoration of the South's political power within the Union, which is what he wanted, the restoration of the South's political power within the Union. And he, this is the note he strikes in this interview with a New York reporter just a few weeks after the surrender. In Lee's mind, he, in a sense, has drawn a line at the sand at Appomattox. Confederates will concede defeat, but the North should ask nothing more of them. And he issues a kind of warning. He says, if there are... Uh, radical measures, if there are punitive measures, then we'll renew the fight. It, it, it's a notion of the Appomattox as a contract to which both sides have agreed to, one that imposes conditions on the North, and, and a notion that the peace rests on the North upholding its part of the bargain. And its part of the bargain was to ask Southerners to yield, but to ask no more of them than to yield. And this is fundamentally is Lee's position. Now, what will happen is that Northerners will uh, will say, 
we don't simply want you to yield, we want you to change. And the response of Lee and Southerners will be to demand a change of us is to punish us. Demands for change are punitive in their very, in their very nature. And this is a, this is a, 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 a sort of line of thinking that, that um, we, see, we see evident in, in, in the, the records we have of Lee's comportment in the year after the war. For me, a sort of key moment of d discovery was um, to realize that Grant himself does an interview with a newspaper shortly after the one-year anniversary of the war in May of 1866. And in that interview, Grant says he's deeply disappointed in how Lee has behaved since Appomattox, that Lee has behaved in a way that Grant had not expected him to behave, that Lee's acceptance of defeat has been grudging and pernicious in its effects. Now that image of a, of a Grant disappointed in Lee's comportment doesn't accord with the gentleman's agreement image that we, that we have. And I, I wanted to understand how it was and why it was that Grant, when, when Lee again technically observed the terms of his parole, what, what did Grant have in mind? And, and uh, in essence, this sort of brings us back to your first question about what were Grant's expectations. And the best way, perhaps, to answer that question is to say that Grant had hoped that Lee would be behave as Longstreet did. Longstreet, Grant, uh, Lee's right-hand man, his war horse, a great Confederate hero. Longstreet, after the war, essentially uh, concedes that the Northern victory has been a victory not only of their army, but of their principles, and that Southerners have to yield to those principles and have to tr find a way to work with the Republican administration. Longstreet is, uh, earns a reputation as a pariah among many Confederates for taking this stand. But I think Grant had hoped that Lee would behave as Longstreet did, and, and Lee chose not to. Let me uh, show you something I, I carry around with me a lot. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a little cross, a hand-carved cross. That, um, and that, uh, that cross and about a dozen others like it uh, used to be um, attached to the mantle over the fireplace of the house that my great-grandmother lived in when I was a child. And um, the, the family stories differ, but one account says that uh, that, that was carved by my great-great-great-grandfather, whose name was Morris Fauchy, though they pronounced it Maurice Fauchy. They had odd pronunciations and spellings of everything. But, uh, but Morris Fauchy and his three brothers all enlisted in the Confederacy in 1861 and 62 in Alabama. One of them died in 62. Then the other three brothers uh, make it all the way to the end. Uh, they're part of the 47th Alabama Infantry, which becomes part of the Army of Northern Virginia early on, and they're there at, at Appomattox and all the final engagements. Uh, there's no record of their thoughts. Uh, they were both privates, inconsequential figures in the end, but they were paroled there on April the 10th or thereabouts. Um, as they began that long trudge back to Alabama and, and a rather destroyed world um, because of where they had come from in Alabama, what was it that, as best you can conjecture, what was it that, that Lee wanted Morris Foshi to go away from the farewell address believing? And what was it that Grant wanted Morris Foshi to have absorbed from the surrender? So Lee wanted M Morris Foshi to go away f uh, feeling uh, that he had uh, done his part in a noble cause and had uh, was not at all to blame for the final result, that the final result was through no shortcoming of his own, that, that, uh, that his cause had been just. This is the sort of essence of the lost cause mythology that the Confederacy had lost but hadn't been wrong. Uh, and he wanted uh, that man to go back committed to, um, to uh, reunion, but, but a reunion, again, in which, in which the South would uh, be restored to prosperity and, uh, and, and, and influence. And effectively what it had been before 1861, I, well, or something yeah, close to that. As close to that as possible. I mean, Lee recognized that the restoration of slavery was an impossibility, but, but he had many white Southerners hoped that there could be a kind of liminal status, a prolonged period of serfdom for African Americans. So in a sense, the, the nostalgia was for a time when Lee imagined a, a time that existed before African Americans had been imbued by abolitionists with false hopes that they might have anything more than this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, 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 serfdom and, and, and subordination. So yes, it's a, it's a nostalgia for the old racial caste system as well as for, um, as for the, the sort of patriotic virtue of the founders, uh, of the founders era. Uh, I think uh, uh, 
Grant hoped that that uh, soldier going home, he, he recognized, Grant was, was not naive in this sense, he recognized how hard it would be for these men to yield the principles for which they sacrificed so much. He didn't think that would be easy. But his, so his magnanimity was, was an effort to, to make it easier than it might have otherwise been. I don't want to paint Grant out to have been uh, naive in that sense. He, he knew perfectly well it would be very difficult for this young man to, 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 uh, to make a new start, but he hoped his magnanimity would help uh, him to, to, to do so. Uh, and and it's, um, it's important to, to note, really, the keynote here for this young man as he's trudging home is uncertainty. Our, our image of the gentleman's agreement suggests that, um, that since Lee and Grant make a peace and at that moment are no longer enemies, that uh, their two armies could uh, could be sort of melt back into civilian life, uh, thinking of uh, thinking that 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 the you know days of conflict were were behind them. Confederate soldiers were very uncertain as to what their future would be. They didn't know exactly what the the uh, you know how the Union government would would behave once things had passed from the realm of the military authorities to the realm of the civil authorities. Um, they were the, and they didn't know how people on the home front would react. Again, there's these two stories. One is a story of disintegration and demoralization, a story in which there may be Confederate failure. Mm. And then there's another story of overwhelming numbers and resources in which there is no Confederate failure. They don't know, as they're trudging home, what people on the home front think. Now, what they will find, and what I found, is that people on the Confederate home front overwhelmingly embraced Lee's overwhelming numbers and interpretations theory. Uh, as I said, they showed a propensity to inflate the size of the Federal Army. They also showed a propensity from the start to, act, to lionize Lee. And the, if we look at Confederate accounts, lionize Lee in defeat, uh, as they lionized him in war, if we look at Confederate accounts of the surrender, newspaper accounts, and what people write in their diaries and letters on the home front, the civilians, we see again a kind of wishful thinking, a fantasy. In the eyes of, in the minds of Confederates, the surrender is an enactment of Lee's superiority to Grant. A story circulates through the Southern newspapers, Confederate newspapers, right after the surrender, in which the scene goes like this. Grant, uh, Lee offers his sword to Grant, and Grant says, oh, General Lee, I could never take a sword from such a man as you. You weren't whipped. You were overwhelmed by numbers and resources. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Lee, so <laughs> Lee re re Grant sort of bows down before Lee in this, uh, in this fantasy, a Confederate diarist, a young a uh, woman wrote uh, uh, an account of the surrender uh, in her diary. She was very far from events. She was in South Carolina, but this was the story as she understood it. She wrote that as Lee left the McLean House, the Union soldiers cheered for him, uh, that, um, that Union soldiers dared not say one insulting word to Confederate soldiers in the days after the surrender. Why did, they, why did the Union soldiers behave so submissively? Because, as she put it, they feared the lion even in chains, Lee the lion, still uh, you know, demanding uh, the, the sort of uh, respect of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of the Union soldiers. So, so th this man will find that, that, the, that the overwhelming numbers and resources of interpretation of Confederate defeat will, will hold sway among Confederates and that it, it, it will serve to, to embolden that young man to think that maybe a change of heart isn't necessary. And, the, and as it turns out, the story of the sword and the story of the uh, Union troops uh, cheering for Lee those, in fact, were not true. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. The, and what did happen with the sword? The, 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 there, was nev there was never any exchange of the sword. Lee never offered it to Grant. Never, but there was never, the spectacular never, never, never sword. Took it. There was a spectacular sword. It's now on display at the Museum of the Confederacy in, in Appomattox. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's you know, a, a lot of mythologizing about, about the scene uh, it, it itself. So in the eyes of Confederates, Lee, uh, in that moment of surrender is every bit Grant superior as he had been all along. And, and Lee's comportment at the moment of surrender is just another sign of, his, of his, uh, his noble character. In the eyes of Union men, Lee uh, at, at the McLean House is someone who is, has been, uh, is, is, um, is bitter and powerless and incapable of, of, uh, of, of you know, true civility. Uh, someone who is uh, who is sad, uh, 
and angry. You know, they, they, they don't see uh, this as a moment that, that, um, that, you know, sort of shows Lee in the best light. Quite the contrary. Again, in the eyes of Union men, Grant has all the cards of that final moment. Grant and the Union men occupy the moral high ground, and Confederate men and Lee um, are on the moral low ground, where in the eyes of Union men, they, they, had, they had been uh, all along. The other issue that immediately is on the table and that Lee talks about in these early accounts afterwards and uh, is, in fact, slavery. Right. And Lee begins to, right off the bat, uh, say, to make claims that, that this had really not been about slavery, that slavery was going to fade out anyway, and that the best men of the South uh, would have found a way to do away with slavery anyway. All of these, this message that we still hear today in lots of conversation about the Civil War, and it's very, very different from all of the claims at the time of secession and what Jefferson Davis and others were saying the, the necessity of secession was about. But, but this question of what is the what is the fate of African Americans? What's going to happen to these four million formerly enslaved African Americans who themselves don't quite know what's about to happen? Slavery will come to an end, but will they become citizens? Will they actually get to vote? And that's really the seminal issue at dispute in these varying accounts of, of what the meaning of the surrender was. Right, that's right. And the point I'd like to emphasize here is that African Americans, both slave and free, are very much part of these debates as participants in these debates about the meaning of the war. And this was the, the discovery in the course of my research that was the most eye-opening for me. This book had its origins in an assignment I was given some years ago. I was asked to give a talk at a commemoration of Juneteenth, this June 19, 1865, when emancipation was announced in Texas. It became an African-American holiday uh, in the Southwest and eventually around the country. I didn't know much about Juneteenth, so I thought it was a good chance to educate myself. And in the course of researching Juneteenth, I kept running across references by African Americans, um, uh, ministers and reformers and politicians and editors and folks who wrote memoirs and people who were interviewed in the 20th century as part of a project to record the memories of of people who had been slaves. And all these sources, I kept seeing references to Appomattox as a freedom day, to a widespread belief on the part of African Americans that Appomattox, April 9, was the day that promised the Emancipation Proclamation was fulfilled, the day that freedom became a reality. And uh, I, I saw this not only among Virginia slaves, people like Bush, Booker T. Washington, but among uh, those who had been slaves very far away from Appomattox. When they learned of Lee's surrender, that's when they, the moment they first felt they were free. And sometimes this was because the news of the surrender sort of prompted a scene in which masters would gather slaves and announce that the war was over uh, and that the Confederate cause was a dead letter and that, and that the slaves were free. They had felt they hadn't had to make such an announcement while they still were, were in control. So slaves understood that the defeat of Lee's army uh, 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 marked the end of the Confederate cause and therefore the end of, of slavery. This is a reminder Again, a useful reminder in this sesquicentennial year in which we celebrated the Emancipation Proclamation that emancipation was not a moment but a process, and that many African Americans felt that that process wasn't fulfilled until the Confederacy was a dead letter, until Lee had surrendered to Grant. There's another sense in which African Americans are absolutely central to this story, and that gets us back to the story of that last week of fighting. So Lee has it in his mind that his troops might break through the federal defenses and a turn south to North Carolina, and he finds on the morning of April 9 that his way is blocked. And his way is blocked by African-American soldiers in the United States colored troops who have been rushed to the front, a few days of harrowing uh, marching, have been rushed to the front, and they're the ones, these infantry divisions of the United States colored troops who block Lee's escape route and who prompt the southern soldiers to put up those white flags. and, and to. This is, again, Lee's realization that he's not going to be able to burst through the federal defenses. For African Americans, their presence in this campaign had enormous political significance. We all know the story from Glory and other sources of what a struggle it had been for African Americans to enter the Union Army. Prejudice had kept them outside of it uh, in the initial stages of the war, though they had rushed to volunteer. They eventually are able to fight. They, uh, uh, and, and put in combat situations where they prove their mettle. It takes a long time before they are able to uh, put in a position where they can face Lee's army, the sort of flower of Southern manhood. They believe it to be richly symbolic that they have defeated that army, that army which in their minds represents the slave system and represents 
uh, the, 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 their tormentors, the Southern uh, aristocracy. So we will see an African-American discourse in the post-war period lasting well into the 20th century, a, a, a distinct pride in the idea that uh, African-American troops fired the last shots at Lee's army. Well, this will be a kind of epigram, another epigram to sort of sum this up from Crispus Attucks to Appomattox, a sort of story of African-American military heroism. And African-Americans will stake their claims to citizenship and to voting, full citizenship and to voting in the post-war period, in part on this service to the Union Army and particularly on this critical role they played in the very final moments of, of, uh, of the campaign. So um, Appomattox looms large in African American culture as a as a as a Freedom Day. That's absolutely fascinating that uh, that it was African American soldiers were there at that point, and it's also interesting to me that until the movie Glory came out, which was about 20 years ago now, yeah. it's been a long time. Uh, up until about then, uh, the way I remember as a kid growing up in the South was that there was some uh, uh, doubt or dispute about whether there had been black soldiers at all or whether, whether African Americans had just been loaders and stevedores and such. Uh, but the idea that African Americans were in fact in a critical position and not just for symbolic reasons. And so this question though of what's going to happen to African Americans and at the same time that uh, initially you have that uh, Grant uh, says that, look, we can just make a military deal. And mm -hmm. the political questions that have to do with the, the reconstruction of the country and other things, uh, those are, uh, Lincoln must make those decisions, right. the Congress must make those. Then Lincoln is killed, uh, and Andrew Johnson becomes president, and the, all the controversy around him. But when he becomes president, he initially is saying, I'm going to hold the leaders of the rebellion to account for this. Uh, they are, in fact, traitors. The view of Lee in the North, by many people, is that he's a murderous traitor. He's specifically called that in much of the press. He's indicted by a grand jury in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, shortly after the war. Uh, there is much momentum toward this version of things, punishing the South, forcing it to abandon these views that really are about the view of the position of African Americans in some regard. And yet, in the end, Everyone is pardoned. Lee is pardoned. Uh, the president himself and Grant campaigns on his behalf to have the indictment quashed. He's not prosecuted. No one is prosecuted except the, those involved in the conspiracy assassination. Uh, and in the end, what Lee and most white Southerners were angling for, that African Americans would be returned to a, an apolitical peasant class, is essentially what happens and extends for another 80 years. Yes, and there, there's... there's uh you know, the things that some people thought and feared might happen, that, that Johnson's ascent to power, Johnson had really talked tough against the Southern aristocracy in his own political career. And when Lincoln was assassinated, some people thought, well, you know, this is God's will. Lincoln was inclined to be far too lenient to these defeated Southerners. And now Johnson will come in and mete out the punishments that, that, uh, that uh, they perhaps uh, deserve. Um, Johnson... Uh, proves uh, to be, as you said, very, uh, uh, very, very lenient, and 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 there's a, none of these this sort of wave of reprisals of executions and trials and indictments comes to pass. The northern public doesn't have a stomach for such things, and they don't in part because they believe that the Confederates have been punished already; that the war was their punishment. They were punished on the battlefield. They worry that once you begin indicting people, where do the indictments stop? You know, uh, 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 that's a problem. They worry about making martyrs of Confederates who might be singled out for punishment. I mean, Lincoln says, we don't know much about what he would have done, but, but he, he does say, you know, if Jefferson Davis was to kind of slink off into Latin America and go away, that'd be fine with me. You know what I mean? Better, better for him to be gone than for, for, for me to have to make a martyr of him. So Northerners are worried about uh, uh, worried about that. And most of all, those, that, those sorts of waves of reprisals don't come because Northerners believe that the best way to honor Lincoln's memory is to uh, institute the kind of peace he wanted, which was a peace uh, with, with, with mercy. So uh, there's been a, if we look at the history of this period, the, the surrender is often eclipsed by the assassination. And if you were to go to a library and see how many books they're written about Appomattox and how many books they're written about Lincoln's assassination, you would find that the books about the assassination far outnumber the books about the surrender. And for a long time, there was a sort of belief that uh, 
in the wake of the assassination, Northerners' impulse to mercy evaporated and they all start calling for vengeance. There, there was some of that, but there was really a kind of call and response. Those who called for vengeance were answered by people who said, let's not turn them into martyrs. Let's be true to Lincoln's vision of the peace. Um, and so, so, so this, this is the sort of uh, northern view of things. And again, a kind of hopeful view that this kind of magnanimity will, will not only bring about reunion, but repentance and conversion. Southerners see things very differently. I mean, con for Confederates, this mercy is something that had been promised at Appomattox. And uh, again, for me, a sort of key and surprising discovery was the following. The terms on the face of it quite simple. They say, and the parole these Confederate soldiers issued says this too, that this soldier is not to be disturbed if he obeys the laws in force where he resides. So, and ceases fighting. If he doesn't fight, ceases obeys fighting. the law. Not to be disturbed. Not to be disturbed. Eh, seems simple enough. So Lee requests that each of his soldiers be given such a pass. Grant accedes to the request. Grant thinks that these parole passes will remind the Confederates of the obligations attendant upon their status as paroled prisoners of war who are whose freedom is contingent on their good behavior, fine. But for Confederates, that not to be disturbed clause becomes politically very important. Because the moment that Northerners start to talk about things like African American civil rights and black suffrage, Confederates turn to them and say, but you promised that we were not to be disturbed. And those things disturb us very, very much. Very much. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, I mean, literally, literally, that clause is invoked as part of a covenant that the South will uphold and that the North has betrayed. And indeed, the long arc of this story, I, I, part of really what I try to do here is, is to say, we want to understand the surrender's meaning. We have to look closely at its immediate aftermath, and particularly at the year after the war, which we sometimes rush through on our way to the things we know are coming, Johnson's impeachment, radical reconstruction, and so on. So I argue that we, uh, we need to linger over that moment. And if we linger over that moment, what we see is that very soon, the various political rivals, the stakeholders in these debates about Reconstruction are turning to their opponents and saying, you have betrayed the true spirit of Appomattox. So to put it another way, I'm not simply arguing in this book that bitterness persists between the two sides. It does, to be sure, and that's important to acknowledge. What I'm arguing is that across the spectrum, Americans embrace Grant's magnanimity, but they invest it in very different, with very different sorts of meanings. Uh, and, and again, rivals will turn to each other and say, you've betrayed the true spirit of Appomattox. So uh, Lee and his followers will say any attempt to really change the racial caste system is a betrayal of the Appomattox terms. Uh, uh, Grant and his followers will say that Johnson's lenience, which plays right into the hand of Lee's vision of restoration of Southern power, is a betrayal of the terms um, very soon. So a notion that Appomattox is a covenant is ubiquitous, but it, it, it very soon comes to be seen as a covenant that's been broken. And on the question of uh, black voting, black suffrage, the, that is the catalyzing uh, element of these, of these discussions. Yes. And, uh, and interestingly enough, you point out uh, a Democratic senator from New Jersey in the midst of the first debate about whether to allow uh, the former slaves to vote uh, actually takes a public position that, well, we can't do something like this because this would contravene all of the laws of New Jersey and New York and all these other places in the North that limit African Americans Absolutely. to a segregated life. Right. And this is, this is a second very, very important theme. So we have debates about the meaning of the terms. These debates don't simply pit the North against the South or the Union against the Confederacy. They pit those in favor of a thoroughgoing transformation of the South against those opposed to it. And we'll find Northerners and Southerners in both camps. The surrender debates reveal the deep divisions within each society. And you've just alluded to this on, on, uh, in the Northern case. So what I found is that Republicans in the North, people who had supported the Lincoln administration, saw the surrender as a vindication of their party and of their leader uh, and, and, of, and of their political principles. But there, were in the, there was in the North an opposition party, the Democratic Party. And the more militant wing of that opposition party, the Copperheads, the anti-war Democrats, had loathed Lincoln and had said so again and again and had decried his radical policies of emancipation and suspension of habeas corpus and so on. And these copperheads, it, it, when the Union wins the war, are loath to uh, concede to Lincoln and his party that they have won a victory, that they have won a mandate. So the copperheads embrace Lee's interpretation 
of Confederate defeat. The Copperhead Press in the North says, Lee is every bit Grant's equal. He's been overwhelmed by numbers. This is not at all a, 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 a vindication of the Republican, Lincoln's Republican administration. We see, in other words, that the surrender terms are politicized and, and sort of spun, uh, as we might put it today, from the very start. And this, the, the, the sort of uh, keen um, effort by these copperheads to push this position is just a reminder that racism ran very deep in the North, that opposition to black civil rights ran very deep in the North. Grant uh, comes to embrace a, the program of congressional reconstruction to, to uh, sort of dissolve the Johnson governments, which had fallen into the hands of former Confederates and, and, and had given rise to a, all kinds of uh, a prescriptive le legislation against African Americans and again to attempt to return as much as possible to the antebellum status quo. Grant favors making a new start in the South uh, 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 with the help of the military Republican, you, you know, uh, establishing Republican governments in the South, and he s understands black suffrage to be a key tool for this. And, and he, as he says in his memoirs, he comes around to this belief because he believes in the end that it's the only way to disabuse Confederates of the notion that they're entitled to run the country again. You know, that, that's, that's, they, they came to that conclusion very quickly, that they were entitled to run the country again. Grant resents this and comes to see African-American suffrage as the only way to prevent it. He will, as president, do, uh, uh, um, try to enforce uh, protections of African-American civil rights. The Enforcement Acts passed during his, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, terms of office uh, will try to do this, but he'll find that it's, it's very, very difficult to do and 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 that lament you refer to just reminds us of what a, in a sense what a what a discursive trap it was this notion that um, if we push too far then they will claim that we have broken faith Grant was was aware of this and 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 it was a kind of trap he he worried about and this sort of you said. Lee was indicted for treason and Grant, and he writes Grant and he asks for Grant's help and says, I don't mind standing trial, but my understanding of the terms was that they protected me from a treason trial, and Grant agrees with him. And again, it's not because he believes Lee is blameless, but he believes that the terms were a military convention that protected Lee's uh, life, that Lee would have never surrendered if he had believed that he was going to be hung. Uh, or that uh, Confederate troops were going to be punished. And Lee, Grant is worried even at that moment about Lee and Confederates being able to say, you've acted in bad faith, you haven't done what, I mean, he's aware that Confederates construe the terms as a promise of honorable treatment, uh, and that is a bit, of a, a bit of a trap. There's another fascinating thing that happens in the late 19th century as the, the, the lost cause mythology grows, and so much of this, I mean, is it fair to say that, that uh, not Lee alone, but that really the, the seeds of the great lost cause narrative begin, in a sense, with, with Lee's response to the surrender. Is that a fair thing to say? It, it, it's, it's, it, is, it is a fair thing to say if, if, in fact, the heart of the lost cause argument is, is the notion that s Southerners have nothing to you know, repent of or, or atone for. Um, I think that, that, that uh, that's a fair statement, I, 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 but I'm arguing in a sense, I'm trying in a sense to recapture the contingency of the moment. So I believe that the gentleman's agreement myth with this notion of healing and a meeting of the minds and a bearing of the hatchets doesn't quite get at the story right, but I also in a sense am arguing against another interpretation and that is that, that um, Grant concedes far too much and at this moment the lost cause tide already starts to wash over America. I'm trying to say something different and that is that Grant didn't believe he was conceding anything at Appomattox. That's not what he thought he was doing. Um, he, he believed that, uh, that uh, he, was, he was trying to inscribe a particular story about why and how the war had been won and what that victory uh, meant, and Southerners will contest that story from the very start. But in 1866, nobody knows yet that the lost cause mythology is going to triumph. Again, we, we, we know it, and I, 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 I'll, I'll qualify even that. I think that, that, uh, that um, recent work by a number of different scholars has shown that, if, if you will, there's the lost cause narrative, overwhelming numbers and resources, a blameless South. There's a counter narrative that the, again, the Union victory was a vindication and, and, and a, a, a proof of the superiority of the North system. Um, that counter-narrative 
is very potent and persists. The lost cause mythology never sweeps it aside altogether. But, but that's, in a sense, become another myth for us, a myth that the lost cause mythology holds sway and that, and that uh, it's a tide that sweeps along everyone in its path. I'm, I'm trying to argue something different, that, that Grant and his men really contest the lost cause mythology. Grant, uh, and, uh, you know, again, really deeply resents the idea that it was, it was uh, the numbers and not the skill and virtue of his men that, that won the day. That's a good place for us to bring this to an end. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.